Hello and welcome to Flooring Models live Q&A with Phil and Steve. Here we are on the 17th of May uh, 2016 and Steve, are you alright mate? How's it going? Yeah, not so bad. Going well, as they say. What are you working on? Um, my tornado still. You'd be glad still? Have you finished sanding it yet? Hey, hey, wait till you see. Oh look, we have paint on. Yeah. Actually, Very nice. Very posh. So it's already for its uh, day calling now. Cool, cracked on with that one, well. Yeah. No, it's fantastic, it's that is. It's got a little bit of black to put on the spine, but. Yeah. But yeah, it's coming on nice. Very nice. Well, and um, whose uh, sand color did you use? I used um, extra acrylics. Yeah. And uh, thinned it with the Vallejo airbrush thinner. And seemed All right. It went on well. It does now and again, it'll, you need to keep cleaning your needle. Hmm. So I just had a little pot with a bit of airbrush cleaner in there and every so often got a paintbrush where I kept the needle clean and yeah, it went on a tree. Now, was that a brand new bottle? It was, was a it? new bottle. Yeah. So that is the secret I think to using those is if it's a brand new bottle, the stuff works brilliantly. It seems to be if it's like six months down the line after it's been opened, it tends to be a bit horrible. But it looks a nice colour. Yeah, it is. Let me put you on full screen again and then... Uh, where are we? Four, I think you are. There we go. Obviously, Very a lot of the nice. weathering's got to be done after the day calls have gone on. Yeah. So you can't really. There's a little bit of fading on there, and but yeah, it's. No, it looks really nice. So is that the standard type of pre-shading in there first? And I use yeah, I just use some brown. Um, Very nice. Flat brown. Mm. Just brush painted the. Um, Belay all metallics on the exhaust. Mm -hmm. It's very nice. And um, for those thrust reverser buckets, what are they? What paint? Um, it was, I believe it's dull aluminium hmm. and steel. Very used. nice. Because it's a nice colour. It's a real yeah. authentic, you know, sort of look to it. But yeah, I just brush painted it on because it's so nice to brush paint. It don't leave brush marks. No. It's the same, you see on the tail. Yeah silver on there and then for the uh, the guns very nice steel and also the, the fueling probe and whose markings is it going to be it's going to be uh, I'll show you if I can get it I am going for Nikki Nora Batty Snoopy Airways, which is that one. Very nice. No, nice markings, I must admit. And yeah. what weapons load are you going to go for? Well, that's, I uh, don't know at the moment. Um, I'll have to have a think about that. I think uh, Nathan has got to help me out choosing the weapons, and so I'll get a proper authentic load on it. Oh, very nice. As I say, you know, it's nice to see it with the old JP233 underneath it because it makes them look really big and meaty then with that hang on underneath it. But uh, it was sort of standard sort of clusters and everything else, wasn't it, in the first Gulf War? Yeah. Second one, it was a bit more precision, but the first one, I think it was just everything, wasn't it? Yeah, I'll see what he's come up I know he said he does have quite a lot in his spare box that I can have, so we'll find mm. something that's got to be of use. Cool, very nice. Well, for me, I've been, hold on, I've got to change all my things around now. I've been busy with this little guy down here. I've uh, been working on the Osprey, and I have to say, it's a dream kit. This thing, I've only been working on about two hours, uh, and we are to this stage already. So technically, we've done the wing areas. This is all ready to sort of be sort of mounted on here, however it goes. Uh, it's a shame it doesn't actually twist round so you can have it in the stowed position, all of this, but, you know, generally for the in-flight one and everything else, this is generally a live test fix. I haven't tried it. Look at that, it fits. No problem. Got a slight little step down in there we'll have to take care of and everything else, but it goes together really, really well. No problem at all. And like I say in the video for it, the nice thing is it's being 
Uh, Hasegao, it's that crispy type of plastic. And I know it's a bit like Marmite, you either love it or you hate it, but I quite like it because it's easy to get it off the sprue. It sounds very nice uh, and glues together particularly well uh, with no real problems. A couple of nasty issues with it, like we've got this big flat seam down the back, so it needs to be taken out properly. So that's why I've elected to come in with some um, styrene, liquid styrene right the way over it and just gone to town with it to fill it all in. I'm gonna let it dry for a couple of hours so it shrinks back on its own and then we can get in there and do it. But the whole point of this one is I'm gonna build it complete then paint it and that goes right down to the cockpit itself so that's why the cockpit's all installed there i'm going to paint it and everything in situ you can get in there it's nice it's big it's open we can go in there a couple of little crew figures which for a change you get them on one twenty seconds with posable arms as well so it's complete job on these with these guys you've actually got just the body uh, the torso and the legs the arms are separate and so is the head so you are quite posable in there but i think it's just enough to make it look a bit nicer we're probably not going to have this thing in flight even though it does come with a little stand as well which is another little touch nice touch with it which i thought was a, a particularly nice thing now i do it in flight it'll look better yeah, well, you could do, but put the gear down. I suppose I could have it all hanging out, put the flaps down and have it as if it's hovering into land and all the rest of it. But it's even got, you might be able to see it just under there, a little display thing uh, to actually base it. But it's nice that you get the old fashioned type sprue with it all on. So you can actually have it in flight, which is something I haven't seen that for many, many years. So uh, nice little touch. Thank you, old Hasegal, for doing that. It is quite nice of you to add a few little things in there like that. Uh, right, so if we just go something like that, no, nope, try again, which one are we? I can never remember, three. Let me try three, there we go, both of us in. Uh, as ever, we've asked three questions, not so many this week, so we'll be off early. Okay, but we have got a few down on here. So starting off with, Arthur says, hello Phil, I purchased the Tamiya Abrams M1A2 tank kit uh, so I could follow your video build, uh, but unable to find it using the search feature. Uh, when I search, I get blank screens. Could you uh, give me directions on how to find it? To be honest, Art, it's discontinued. It's one of the really early ones and we don't put them up because they're in boxes literally this big. Uh, it would have been back done in the early 2000s. Yeah, it would have been about 2004, something else like that. So it has been retired, that particular bill. But Steve's done quite a few of those, haven't you? Yeah, have probably. we got photo builds of your ones on the site um, and things? I'm sure we have floating I think around. there might be the one where I convert one into the uh, Tusk 2. Hmm. I think that's yeah. on that. And I think I did one as well for the uh, for a group build. Very early Gulf War group build. Yeah, yeah. Because unfortunately the thing is, because uh, a lot of people say, well, can't you just put them up? It's got a lot of normal music. Because in those days you used to be able to get away with it. But now I just get a copyright strike against me straight away because it has got music throughout it, uh, which is probably owned by somebody with more money than I've got to be able to fight it. So I can't go back. It'll take forever to re-edit, redo it, to take all the music out and various bits and pieces. And then because I'm talking over some of the music, so you would have to cut me out of it as well uh, and everything else like that. So that's why those ones were retired some time ago that said I would love to have a stab at the new Meng one wherever it is down there because um, it does look particularly nice and I'd like to have a go at that one somewhere in the future so watch out for that build somewhere along the line but say I know Steve's done some great ones on that uh, Martin says uh, hi Phil and team what is the best fluid to use in an ultrasonic bath the instructions say water, wood Valero thinners, or X20A. Um, I will be cleaning the nozzle of my airbrush and some tools and that. Love the show uh, and the forum is ace. Regards, Martin. Do you ever use ultrasonic cleaner, Steve? I got, well, I did when they kind of a craze, everyone was buying one, I got one. Uh, hmm. And it comes with your special cleaner product that you can get in there, some kind of yeah, what they call it, some weird like sea water or right. something funny. Um, but to be honest, you probably could use just good old tap water and, and do a 50 50 mix with a bit of Vallejo yeah. airbrush cleaner. Yeah, also, I must admit. I just yeah, soak it in IPA, over mm. and that tends to shift all the grime in. If you've got one of them little airbrush cleaning brushes. Yeah. That's what uh, I do on that. To be honest, that's what I would say. The ultrasonic cleaners, they went through or seemed to go through a bit of a fad a few years ago and everybody went out and bought one. I think the Lidl's were doing them for something like a tenner, weren't they? 
uh, and it seemed to be the thing to do. I've never had success with them. I don't particularly like them. The thing you have to watch out for when you're just chucking parts in there is that it's obviously the ultrasonic, as in tiny vibrations, is slightly going to move all your parts and your various bits in there. I'm more inclined to soak them and then just get in there and scrub them out. I think that'll do a better job than if it's welded in. So I think if you've got dry paint in your nozzles, your bits and pieces, even with an ultrasonic, I don't think it's gonna shift it particularly brilliantly. Um, it's because it's not like normal dirt and grime that you get on jewelry. I know it's great for using it on jewelry, but that's because it's just grime that's got in there. This stuff is etched in, it's welded in and dried in. I'm with Steve, I'm far more inclined to say, right, put it in a little bath of IPA, leave it overnight, bring it out, get the little brushes in there, clean it through, you can see exactly what you've got, flush it, dry it off, and you're good to go within a couple of you know minutes of getting it out of the bath. The other thing as well, if you've got to fill up a bath of from an ultrasonic cleaner, that's gonna be a hell of a lot of fluids, isn't it, really, with IPAs and your, um, you know, if you're gonna use like Tamarix 28, you've got to fill it up with it. So probably better, I would say, to use a little bath, and I tend to just literally use things like these. I'll soak IPA and put them into one of those, let them float around, give them a shake every now and again, and uh, the next day come out, clean them out, flush them back through and everything else, and it's job done. Yeah, rather than messing around with ultrasonic cleaners. Yeah, Phil, I've just put further hmm. on in the question and answers thread a uh, link to my Tamiya Abrams. Oh, right, well done. So there we go. We've got the link in there as for that one as well. Okay, so Peter says, uh, hey Phil, with the available, sorry, yeah, with the availability of ready-made enamel washes, AK, as in AK, MIG, etc., along with your clay wash, uh, where do oils fit in? Uh, the, uh, are there times that oils would work better in certain situations? Can oils achieve an effect that other weathering techniques can't? Uh, uh, just uh, trying to wrap my head around their uses. Um, there are so many options available now. From my point of view, and I know Steve will probably go a bit more in detail when I release him on this question, but the thing is I like about oils is that they blend really, really well. So you can have it from being a neat colour, like I did on the uh, colouring me up with the Halifax, where I just took the grey and just smudged it over the centres of panels everywhere and then just blended the hell out of it just to lighten everything up. Um, so you can do that with neat oils without thinning it and that literally was straight from the tube straight on the model. Okay. Other times you can come in there with a little bit of thinners and thin it and you'll notice it will go from anything from being a solid paste if you like through to a, a water. So you've got that area of movement with oils which I quite like. You don't get that with enamels. Enamels tend to be thin uh, and give you nice sort of streaking or uh, a staining for want of a better word or the wash effect right over it. Uh, the clay wash again it's very specific of what it does. It's designed to grind down and give texture in paint and stuff like that whereas oils were a lot more delicate, they're a lot more refined and also with oils you can make anything from a wash to a neat item if you like to actually paint it solid and it gives you the movement right the way between them you know so that's what I like about oils is that way that you can go along and take it from being just like paint on your model to a wash by just adding thinners to it uh, and you can do streaking and various other items that traditional other things it just takes a little bit more work that's what I like about them anyway. Steve go for it. Yeah what's really good about me for example if you've got if I were doing a piece of armour and it were just olive drab, what you can do with oils is add highlights, shadows to different areas. So, for example, where there'd naturally be a shadow, if you're looking at your model, it's just got to be the same colour as the rest of your tank. So maybe add a bit of dark brown or a bit of dark blue, and then you can start building the shadows in to give it a more of a 3D effect. You can use them to put on grime and dirt, so that really ground in uh, that you see on vehicles so it does look as though you know you're building up layers so it's uh, it's quite hard to describe but there are there's a lot of stuff that you can do with oils that there's no other product could come anywhere that can do it yeah you know. no i agree and you know from my point of view what i like about them sometimes is i'll use the neat uh and then if i'm not liking the effect it's giving then you can literally just fade it back 
uh, which is something you can't necessarily do with a wash because you tend to take it all away because it's very thin. But for instance, when I was doing the wings on the, the bomber, um, I just went over the roundels with the gray, just around the blue areas and the red, just to fade it back a little bit. And I look at it and thinking, don't really like that. So like Steve taught me a trick when we were first doing it, uh, which is you get your brush, put it in your thinners, and then get rid of the lot of it, everything off of it, because you'd be surprised. It just keeps giving and giving and giving. And then just gently flicking over it, you could take it from what I thought was too strong and just knock it gently back over a bit of time. So you're almost dry brushing right over the roundel and it just fades it all in and it's just making it blend in very easily, which is something I don't think necessary if I was doing it with an enamel over it or even my clay wash and stuff, it's either there or it's not. Um, but with the oils, because it's a little bit more grippy and it sort of pulls and drags, you can just blend it around and do things. And that's what I like about them. Um, and it is their simplicity. And technically, as long as you've sealed your model, you're pretty safe with it. You can just get it all off. So if you wanted to use it as a panel line wash, then knock yourself out. If you wanted to use it for doing smoking, like, yeah, to be honest, we used it on the bomber to give, I wanted to give that gray look over the top of the wings. Originally, I was gonna do them very heavy. But when I was looking at photos of it, it doesn't look like, unless they've had an engine fire or something, uh, or leaking, uh, but generally they tend to have that sort of gray hue over the wings, which is the lead in the fuel. And then they have the darkness in amongst it. But ten looking at all the photos I could see of them, obviously a lot of them are in black and white, tended to be mostly white. And I just wanted to give it that effect. And that was a great thing, because all I did was start with a little bit of gray at the top, and then just dragged it all the way down. And it just blends it out. And if it was going a bit too wide, you could just bring it back in and just knock it in and then streak it back and it gave a really nice effect and in some cases didn't like it I just took it off and started again so you can do lots of things with oils the only drawback to oils or as I find it is the time it takes them to dry um, so you have to give it a couple of days for them to go off uh, even if you know it's a very thin coat otherwise when you're handling it you're going to find you've got it on your hands uh, and that's something where you can then start rubbing it off and going through it but it's just a case of being gentle handling with it but give it three if i've had like three days on that one it was dry i could handle the wings i could rub right over it and nothing was coming off and it didn't feel oily at all either um, so yeah it definitely works but i do like that odorless thinner steve it worked an absolute oh, yeah. treat on that get some but another yeah. way of explaining it, it's like if you look at Phil's face now, you could paint it an overall flesh colour, but then you see in his cheeks a little bit of red. So you could get a red colour and then blend it in and, and you'll still see the base colour coming through, but you'll have put that nice little red rosiness to the cheeks and then you could add the shadow. So if you want to replicate Phil's beard, you'd put a bit of grey and maybe a touch of blue in Well, a lot of grey these days. Yeah, but that's how you do it. Because <laughs> the base colour will still come through, but you're changing adding the little bits of colour and adding another layer on top of it. Yeah. But they are, it's well worth getting even a basic start sign, just practising. Mm. And like we said, you know, there's, um, I paid peanuts for my little set. Uh, my only thing is they're leaking. I found that when we do, when you get to this part of the video, the, it's coming out, the oil is seeping out of them. I'm finding, have you ever get that, Steve? No, no. It's probably because they are cheap, but that's probably. the... <laughs> <laughs> the trouble with it is they are leaking the oil out of them, which isn't so much of a problem. But uh, yeah, it, but the starter sets you can literally pick up in your little, you know, the cheapy bookshops, stuff like that. They just do, as long as you've got the primary colours, you can work through them and have a go and a play with them. And then if you wanted to, you could go out and buy companies' own brand ones. Uh, the AK do a range of them, which I've been using, which are quite nice. Um, but it's the same, MIG do a range, don't they? Everyone does oils yeah, these days. I tend to use is it a Bytung 303 or something. What? Yeah. I think I've got some, yeah, a drawer full of them. Yeah, 502 it is actually, which is Show it up. them ones. Yeah. So this one is faded dark yellow. Yeah. So that's brilliant for German armour. Um, mm -hmm. German stuff, so you, those, for example, like your FW1 knights with a yellow nose, or you just put a little bit of fade it in, or... Yeah. I'll have to get some. <laughs> yeah, it's quite an orangey colour, so it'd be good just to, like I say, for using on dark yellow German stuff, adding a bit of shadow or... Yeah. But I've got hundreds of different colours. and but the, This stuff, it tells you what it's for, which is good, so you're not guessing. Yeah. Instead of your raw rumbers and your mm -hmm. Napoleon blue and Prussian blue, these give you an idea of what it's yeah. supposed to be for. 
um, they do a lot of really nice surf colours as well so cool. you can blend it in so you've got that dirtiness and the griminess mm -hmm. and rust colours also so it's a good range yeah I might have to get some in and perhaps we'll do a review and a test on them and all the rest of it I'll get some of those in and they last forever that'll last yeah. for a lifetime no that's it that is the thing with them is say with oils they just do go on it's one of those things you buy once you'll never need to replace them at all that's what i said i think when i did the original review on them you know a tube of oil lasts your lifetime because you just use absolutely none of it right okay so there we go uh brett says i'm working on a 148 revel a10 uh it's the old kit that has raised panel lines I did my best to carefully sand around the panel lines, but some have been erased during gap filling. Are there any techniques for bringing them back, or should I go all in and rescribe the entire aircraft? Uh, that seems like a daunting task. It is. There's a couple of little techniques you can do for doing raised panel lines, popping them back in. One of them is to cut it with a sharp knife, and then you'll get what's known as a V trench. Okay, but from an overall look, when you're looking at your model like this, you won't see the difference. Okay, but what basically what you do is you just come along with a sharp blade and just from your panel line that you've still got that's raised, just and join it up with another one, you'll cause a V and it slightly lifts it each side because it's cutting the, the, the sort of plastic in two and it makes it slightly raised. Uh, you can pop them in like that or rescribe the entire thing. It is the trouble. I know there's people out there that use um, the stretch sprue technique and then you glue it down, but in every case I've seen that happen, it tends to go with liquid cement, tend to make it too soft and look. It's not like an original, but that would be your other option. You know, literally stretch sprue, cut it into sections and glue it down on top. But it's not an easy one. Or as you say, you sort of bite the bullet and uh, rescribe the entire thing. But in the A10, there's quite a lot of panel lines on them as well. So, yeah. Steve, what would you... I'd use it as my buster. <laughs> I think go out and buy the Hobby Boss one. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the thing is, the Hobby Boss one isn't perfect. But from a point of view of, you know, compared to other anybody else's ones, it is the one to go with. Uh, it's got, tends to be the correct nose shape. The Italian one, again, is recessed panel lines. But the nose is wrong. It's just too uh, it's too it's too rounded on the front it needs to be slightly squarer uh, but the hobby boss one is pretty much spot on uh, unfortunately the rebel one suffers like the um tamiya one of being raised panel lines uh, which is sort of showing its age a little bit so yeah that's the only way but if you were putting in raised panel lines steve how would you do it i'd probably go with a knife technique like mm. you or you could use masks that go down the masking tape either side where it's come up and just put the thinnest bit of super glue along the top yeah. and quickly pull your tape off just to leave it. Um, there's no other real way, to be honest. No, no. The only other way is to say, I've done it in the past, but it's like mixed results, is to say stretch sprue, and then you lay that down and then glue on top like an extra thin. Uh, and then that tends to etch down and give you a slight step of it. But if you put too much glue, it just flattens out. It's a tiny little bit on there, but it's not an easy one replacing raised panel lines, to be honest. Okay, uh, Steve says, uh, Hi, Phil. Uh, I love the Saturday show, and I hope they become. Uh, this is going to be the norm. Uh, did you get my scrapers I sent you? No, no scrapers yet. I haven't had anything really in this week at all. Uh, from that point of view, so uh, yeah, if you I don't know where you, when you sent them, but I haven't had anything in. But me and Steve are back Saturday morning. We'll be here nine till well, whenever we shuffle off this mortal coil. <laughs> so I'm here all Saturday, so that's not a problem. But no, I haven't had anything yet. As soon as they turn up, I'll let you know. Uh, right, Alan says hi, Phil and Steve. Hope you're both adequately supplied with tea and coffee today. I was. I've drunk mine. Phil, with your Sparmex compressor tank setup, do you need a moisture trap on the extra tank, or is the one on the compressor enough? By the way, uh, for the German members, I got the 3.5 litre tank for 69 euros from Airbrush City. Yes, you do, and it's the one thing I haven't shown. I've moved my moisture trap onto the tank from the compressor. 
So now just take it off the compressor and put it on the tank. Straightforward, it's the same fitting. And then that way it just empties straight from my compressor now, straight into the tank. And then on the end of my tank now, I've actually, well on top of the tank, I've got the actual um, moisture trap. Otherwise what's gonna happen is you're gonna get moisture gonna build up in the tank itself and then it comes out and round. Okay, so you will need to do that if you're doing it in that particular setup or have it in line somewhere between the two. So you could also have, I am thinking about having the moisture trap closer to my work area anyway, because the only thing is I am getting moisture as I noticed the other day in my hose, which is coming out all the way, it's quite a distance. It's probably like 12 feet of hose I've got behind there as it runs around, so it's enough to get to the other side here. And sometimes you get a little bit of moisture in there. Uh, and obviously if that gets in the paint, it can cause you no end of troubles, but you will need a moisture trap somewhere after the tank because the tank is where most of the moisture is going to be so yes okay so uh phil walker says hi phil and steve uh glad to see you're going to keep the mobile camera section in your vlogs great stuff my question is around storing paints and other liquids uh i may be uh relegated to the loft soon and of course it's red hot in the summer uh, and an ice box in the winter I don't see any storage temperatures on Tamiya paints. It just says keep out of direct sunlight. Have you had any issues with storing paints in extreme temperatures? Any tips, hints? Uh, cheers guys, and standing show as always. Take care, regards, Phil. I don't know, Steve, have you? Well, I'm in a... the loft space of mine, aren't I, so? Yeah, but yours um, is a very posh loft space. Yeah, they didn't used to be. It used to be very small before it were extended. Um, yeah. It got ridiculously hot. You know, you're talking over 40 degrees during the summer. Um, yeah. But it never affected the paints because they were out no. of sunlight, just on the, you know, my paint rack, and they never had any problems. Uh, only thing I've found, obviously, is when you come to airbrushing, that were a bit of fun. Yeah. You're going to use a lot of retarder and stuff like that. Um, even now, okay, it's posh and I've got windows, it still gets hot up here, but just don't have any problems. No, I think I, the, it, the problems are if it's in direct sunlight. Hmm. Yeah, I can't imagine it being a trouble with heat. Uh, not unless you're really talking hot, hot. Uh, but again, I think it is a case of direct sunlight. You don't want to be storing them in direct sunlight because of obviously ultraviolet killing your paint anyway. Uh, but as for heat, I can't imagine it's particularly a problem. But as Steve says, as soon as you're using it, hand painting it, or you know, brushing it. The, the difference in temperature can make all the difference. Like if you're doing it and it's really hot, it'll just dry immediately. And if it's freezing cold, you know, then you can have all types of other problems with the humidity and various things as well. Um, what I tend to find though is, you know, obviously just with your thinners and stuff like that, you just want to keep it slightly out of the way a bit because obviously just through evaporation, if nothing else. So if you leave your lid off your thinners, uh, which I am prone to doing all the time when I'm airbrushing, if it's a really hot thing, you're going to find out you're going to have, have a lot of evaporation issues if it's very hot. But I don't think unless you're literally talking anything over 50 degrees, you're really going to have a problem with it. Um, apart from just general usage, storage wise, I wouldn't worry about it. Aerosols uh, and things like that, just keep them in a cupboard out of, <laughs> out of the way, just in case, you know, it tends to be cooler in a cupboard as well, things like that. Uh, but generally paints, I wouldn't really, you know, can't really see a problem with, but just invest in some retarder, um, something like that. And then literally, I think uh, Vallejo do it now, don't they? Little bottles, is it little retarder? I've got one, yeah. Oh, have you got one? Yeah, if you don't yeah, want to go out. I think it came with a paint set that you've got. Oh, is it? I think they might have one in there. All oh, right. Little yeah. bottles like that. Oh, uh, yeah. And it's absolutely brilliant. You only need one drop and you, that'll last you for ages. Isn't yeah, it? so if you are doing hot um, and even cold, because it will just make, it will keep things all moving around nicely. What it is, it's like an oil, I found. Because if you put it in water, it looks like oil. Uh, it's just well like an alcohol if you like going swirling around in this obviously some type of, a, of a, a, an oil effect so it slows down the drying time uh, and literally just makes the paint more slippery uh, gives it more working makes it flow easier you get less sort of you know uh, rough textures things like that purely because it's wet as it's coming out and not drying too much yeah but, it came either that paint set that you got for lay or, or the model air one. Oh right if you okay. look right at the very front Hmm. They have all different, they came with thinners and all right. bits I'll... and pieces. I don't know about in that one. I don't know what we got in here. Right, the front bit's there, yeah. Yeah, I've got matte varnish. 
That's it. Then it's silver and all the other colours, golds. Yeah, I didn't. I would mod it must have been the model air set. Yeah, the model air set. Yeah. I must admit, I'll, I'll, I keep seeing them and I will get a bottle of it. I've got the other one over there, but it'd be nice to try ones that are specifically designed for this type of paint. It might work even better, um, but um, it's it literally is one drop per colour cup. Yeah. That's all you need to use. Don't overdo it because it'll thin your paint and it'll take forever to dry. Um, and obviously if you're used to handling your paint like I do, you like you spray a wing and then grab it, just remember this will slow it down so you will leave fingerprints. Uh, it takes, you know, literally just double your drying times. Yeah, it is just... water based. Yeah. One. It's good as well because it's in the dropper bottle. That's so right, that's what I was thinking as well. It'd be more yeah. handy just to put one drop in your in your paint mix and then go for it like that. Yeah. Definitely, I'll get hold of some. There we go, hope that helps Phil. Okay, Charles, first post. Uh, ex extra colour seem to no longer to be available, um, don't they? Uh, can anyone on the team please recommend a replacement for exec extra colours X395 Airbus Industries Grey or extra colour X331 Sorry, it's got a lorry out the front. Uh, 331, what's that? Corogard? Corogard? Uh, doing the Revel A380 in Singapore Airlines and it's a nightmare to try and get these colours. Something in Tamiya or Vallejo would be nice. Great show, any help, much appreciated. I haven't not doing it anymore then. I know there's some of the colours. Mm. I had a look for the Dolphin, they used to do the International Orange. Yeah. And that one available, so... Oh right, perhaps they're having a bit of a cull. Uh, to be honest, I don't know. Uh, we'd have to have a look up on that. I'll have a look after the show and I'll post up below because I'll have to get out me various bits and pieces to try and find a conversion for it. But uh, unless you've got your phone app of your Steam. It's not on the phone app. No, it's not no, on the I phone either. I don't it's know. Good. To be honest, I don't know those colours. That's the thing. Um, it might be a case of, um, you know, mark one eyeball and try and make a mix for it then if that's the case. Okay, so... Uh, Jerry says, hello Phil, first of all thanks for the many hours I've already uh, watched your video builds. Uh, I came back to the hobby after 20 years uh, and they've helped me a lot, thanks again. My question is about Rebels 132nd BF109 G10, is that the one I've got over there? Which one have I got over there? No it's not over there anymore, where is it? <coughs> oh no I've got the G6. Um, do, 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 do. The painting instructions show the model on the fuselage nicely detailed uh, and I would like to follow it but I have some issues getting the right shape of the models. Uh, since uh, I even struggle with the correct way of doing modelling uh, it's even more difficult to have the right shape. Uh, would it, uh, it would be quite helpful to have uh, some uh, marking uh, on the fuselage to follow the model scheme. I have drawn it with pencil, uh, but now uh, uh, it's at a dead end. Uh, I could erase it afterwards, but since the models uh, to be faded, uh, sorry, uh, the models should be faded, it is visible. Do you have any other ideas for marking? Uh, model mask uh, is also uh, not okay because I have uh, I want to have the exact model and not a, a general. Uh, I have removed all the paint um, already and restarted the whole painting because I have uh, already repainted it several times. I want to learn this modeling uh, on this build. I am really determined. Thank you, Jerry. <sighs> Um, well, uh, yeah. The problem, if I can just interrupt, though, yeah. is one word, exact model, or two words. If you try to replicate it exactly, that has got to be a mission impossible, I think. Get the exact modeling all down the sides. Yeah. Um, I wouldn't have a clue. The only thing I could suggest is, um, I haven't got the instructions here for the G10, but you could photocopy it, scale it one to one, okay, and then literally um, stick it to the side of your model and then spray it 
in a uh, off color to the back color. So it's like that gray blue, isn't it? The backing color, I presume, on all of those, the German Luftwaffe ones. Um, and then if you stick it on, so put down your, the, back, the back color, the, the first color, uh, the light gray, and then go over it with just a shade darker. Okay, so literally, so when you, um, and then basically spray it on, so you've used it like a template, undo it so you'll have it exactly there. And then if you want to distress it and make it look a little bit more realistic than being like hard edge on there, uh, is to literally then go over, because you can still see it there, with a slightly darker gray over the one you've done. That way you won't have to be as accurate because, you know, it's already there, you've got a little bit of gray in there and it should make a nice softer uh, type of camo on it. I don't know the markings you're on about, but we're assuming if it's just the mottling, that's probably how I would do it if you wanted to make it exactly the same is to just literally scan it, blow it up to the right scale, and then, um, you know, cut them out. So you've got all the model holes all the way through, stick it on, and then blow it over the top, and then freehand it afterwards on top of what you've got. So that way you've got the outline of all the ones you want it all the way over the model, uh, and away you go, and you can do it like that. So you know, that's how I would do it. If you wanted it exact, I'd probably freehand it and wing it, to be honest, but if you wanted it exact, that will give you an exact copy on there. Uh, and you can do it that way. So, yeah. Yeah, again, exact. That's the problem. But personally, I'd freehand it and get as close as I can. Hmm. Yeah, I must admit, you know, but I, I think that could work quite well is if you wanted to do it exact way. Because you could obviously just use it as the template itself and do it in sections if you want to. You don't have to do the entire thing. Just take a section, tape it into it so it's like a stencil, blow it over the top peel it off, you have it in there, then as I say, you can easily distress it afterwards by going freehand over the top of it uh, and just work it out all like that. Yeah, I think that works, but I'm just having a look at some images of it now. And yeah. You could get away with doing that, making your own template. Yeah, as I say, I must admit, I don't know. I don't know if it's a slightly different one on that version. They're quite large, other models. It's not that really fine. Oh, right, it's not fuzzy little, type. Yeah, yeah. So it's a large, so you could... Like you say, get a good image and blow it up. Yeah, just uh, just use the plans and just photocopy and scan them and just yeah resize it so it's one to one, and then um, you know literally cut them out you know on the old cutting mat, go around them all, and then put it on. And if it's yeah you know, obviously you don't have to do the entire thing, just do it in sections uh, and put them on there and put it on like that, and that way you can replicate exactly what it is. But if it's the the more solid type than the fuzzy one i've got the g6 down there and it's just very lightly fuzzed in everywhere you can see like with the lip shadow you know the spray just pumped it on by hand all over it to break it up a little bit so yes there we go try something like that okay so uh Josim, is it i think something like that um hi phil uh in one of your past shows Ah, right, yeah, I remember this one. Uh, I think it was one of your live shows with your friends last year. You mentioned a build of a ship where the modeler did a nice job creating an ongoing explosion. Uh, since I want to try this myself, I'm hoping you can give me a hint on which build you were talking about, which I have, and I put the link up for you as well. That was with Ron's uh, uh, Graf Spey. Uh, or Spee, um, he did a little diorama. It's only won 700, and he recently won an award with it. Was he the only entry? I don't know, but he definitely won an award for it. Um, but it's only a little one, but he's used a little bit of LED and um, I think it's uh, nylon uh, stuffing uh, to give that effect. So he sprayed it, lit it, but I've put you there to the link to the completed one. Okay, but also if you look at Ron and go back, he's done the full build for it as well and he explains how he did it all as well. So that is in there as well. So you can do that one. But the link is up there. You can follow him. But Ron did that, who sits here with us uh, the first Tuesday of every month. Okay. Christopher says, Hi, Phil and Steve. Uh, how do you get rid of sink marks in plastic? I've tried to fill them with styrene filler, uh, but now it seems like I can't send a sand them, uh, sorry, sand them flush. How long does styrene filler need to fully cure? I'm afraid of a long-term shrinkage. Kind regards, Chris in Germany. The thing is with it, it depends on how thick your filler is. To be honest, this is mine, and we had it up the other day. Um, and 
you know, I put this on literally just before we come on air and it's dry now, but if I put my nail in it, I know it's gonna be soft for a couple of days, so I tend to let it go off a couple of days. But if you've got a thinner version, it will dry quicker. The thicker it is, the longer it takes to dry. But the thicker it is, the less shrinkage you have, if that makes sense, okay? So if you have a very thin amount, it's because it melts with the plastic as well, you can get shrinkage. Also, it depends on the styrene it's going with. This is quite a hard one. You don't get as much shrinkage with this type, you know, the clanky variety that sound like this, uh, than you do the other one, because this is quite a crisp, hard styrene. You don't get as much in there. But if you're using it soft like Airfix or uh, Revels um, styrene, if you put glues on it, they tend to get sinkage and it takes a while for it all to go off. But I've deliberately done this so I now can get on with all the other smaller parts and things and leave that for a couple of days for it to completely go off before I attack it with sanding. Also, another tip with sanding is to do it very slowly. So use a coarser grit than perhaps you normally would, but very lightly sand it. Because also by sanding really hard on your model, like sink marks, if you put heat into it, you'll generate sinkage because it's the plastic's physically getting hot, it gets softer, you can get sink marks. So by using a coarser grit and slower, you won't get as much sink marks. But if you go in there with a fine grit and you're really going out, you'll generate heat, which will give you sink marks as well. Steve? Yeah, I tend to use styrene filler or soup glue Yeah, to do it. Uh, but then again, it depends where the sink mark is. Sometimes if it's in that deep or stuff like that, I tend to just sand it and blend it in. Yeah, I must admit, if I can get away with not filling, I never will. So if it's a small sink mark, I'll probably sand the plastic all around it to get rid of it. You know, like we did on the airliner, it had them in there, so I marked them, I knew where they were, then just by sanding it, because it's on a curve, you could just blend it in totally without having to fill it. Um, you know, but if you've got something like on a big wing and it's got a sink mark down into it, then I might try and sand and blend it rather than to fill it, uh, you know, and things like that. So I think that works a lot better. If we can avoid filler, because it slows down your building time, I will avoid it at all costs, you know. Okay, so uh, Brian says, another first post. Hi gents, uh, would love to build Eddard's BF109G6 uh, as it does have all the bits in the kit and of course saves on buying aftermarket. Uh, I feel this is a great way forward in uh, Intel modelers. Uh, uh, what is about and the detail you can buy with little expense. Not only that, you can show all your skills with such a heavily detailed kit. Beth, Beth wishes. My father bought me my first kit. It was I was five in 1957. Still loving the hobby, age 63. See, there you go. You probably get a medal for the longest modelling start to finish on the site because most of us all had a thing. Uh, yeah, it would. And to be honest, I would love to have a go at the, one of those because, I've, as I say, when we reviewed the... Uh, where is it? I've lost it down there now. Is it the G6, that one that I did the other day? It is the G6. Uh, I you know, was absolutely blown away with the detail and I'm pretty sure we will be doing it some point before the end of the year. Definitely. And I'd love to have a go at their Spitfire as well. I know we've done some spits over the years, but it'd be nice to do some nice hyper-detailed ones. Uh, so yes, never say never for that one, Brian. Trust me, I'm itching to have a go at it. Okay, when was the last time you built a 109, Steve? Don't think I ever have. What? No. Oh. I've got one in the stash actually, an Eddard one. Yeah. So I'm looking forward to having a go at that. I'm building, uh, me and Keith are building the 190s at the moment, the Eddard ones. Yeah. They're absolutely stunning kit. Yeah, I must admit, I did one of them back in the day, one yeah. of the originals. Um, one of the original builds that was. I think it's still on the site now. And it is a beautiful little kit, must admit. And I've got the Spitfire, i got the uh, really good deal on the royal class oh yeah yeah the one with the uh beer Tankered. barrels under yeah. the weights all the all oh, right yeah the nice one the four wedge flaps look absolutely stunning as well very nice yeah it is a nice kit i must admit it's one of those things i would love to collect is like the royal class stuff with all the bits on there some really nice ones in there and you can get some deals that shows on those so i'll have to keep a look at Okay, Josh says, um, I'm going to build uh, the Revels 148B1B Lancer Limited Edition soon, and I was going to build it with lights like you did in the Typhoon. Uh, what are your tips, tricks, and how do you build with the lights, uh, lighting electronics? 
couple of different options you could use. Uh, I highly recommend to just go and get scale magic, is it they call it? Uh, D, 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 if I can find the ones, oh that's his engines, uh, D, 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 uh, magic scale modeling are the ones we use the lighting set for the typhoon so you can have flashing in the various bits and pieces depending on how you want to do it if you're going to do it something with the engines flickering or you're just talking uh, undercarriage lights on something of that scale it's quite easy because you can hide all the wiring inside it uh, and just stick it all in there uh, and you won't have to worry about it when it's smaller stuff you need to worry about where you're going to feed wires to but on that because it's 48 you could probably do some nice wing uh, nav lights all over it some nice gear light because particularly tasty is a b1 on the ground with all its landing gear lights on because it is quite bright uh, down underneath there so yeah you've got plenty of options or you could just go down your standard led route if you didn't want to do it you can get leds that blink um, just standard they're just pulsing leds and various things but the thing is if you're going to go with something that's got uh, a certain flash timing and stuff like that uh, and various things you can have them pre-programmed and done for you as well there's a couple of companies out there but um, scale magic they do very nice ones you can tell them exactly what you want so you say look i need four engines i want you know blinking nav lights perhaps even slime lines things like that in that scale you could have a go at um, a couple of cockpit lights perhaps in there things like that and they will custom design you the board to your requirements okay and then that way it's literally plug and play and it's all daisy chained and you can just put a cable onto a cable out to the wings or run your own wiring in or whichever way you want to do it so it's pretty straightforward it's just working it all out in the first place just sitting down there studying youtube pictures of them video of them and working out what lights you want and where uh, and then just counting them off. If you just want them permanently on, it's not too much of a problem because you could just run a nine volt battery with that normal LEDs and just wire it up together, okay, and do it that way. But if you want a certain blink rate, um, you know, flickering engine ones perhaps and things like that, then you're gonna need something a little bit more custom. The other one to have a look at is the F-16 that I did, the Suffer, because that had a fully lit cockpit, obviously flashing LEDs, landing lights, nav lights uh, on it and everything else like that. And we used uh, seed LEDs on that one to put that one one in there so yeah it's one of those things it's just a case of working it all out working out where all your wiring is going to go how you're going to feed it all through because obviously you need to build that into your model quite early so it's well worth working it out exactly how and when the wiring is going to go through testing it before you do it all as well making sure it's all working before you put it in and then once you're all happy as your build's progressing and you're sealing things up double check it's working as well before you seal everything up and then if you're happy then you can just move on with it just like that Ever thought of doing anything electronical like that, Steve? Yeah, I'd love to get into an well, nearest thing. Obviously, I've come to is the uh, what do you call it? X wing. Yeah, an moving X -wing. X wing. But that yeah. was so easy to do. But yeah, I'd love to do it, especially with some of the armor that's mm. got interiors. Yeah, because I was actually thinking, as I was talking, I was thinking in my head that you could do a very nice like, internally lit armor and with its running lights on as well and things like that. You know, just very yeah. faint type things yeah that could look really good um, yeah also like talked to you about doing the a400 yeah um, with all its lights on engines moving and that yeah. look really good yeah because me and steve were saying it would be nice if you know this is us getting carried away but you have them in flight engines running nav lights pulsing <laughs> but that's a big model to have with four fans zipping round on the front yeah you know you could custom Hmm. Fan though, isn't it, for summer to keep you cool? Well, it would be quite handy, yeah. yeah. You could just have it running in the corner, yeah. you know, humming away nicely. It'd be one of those you could hang it on a wire and it goes around in a circle. <laughs> vroom, vroom, Probably like would, that. actually, yeah. That'd be good, that would. Right, okay, so. So, yeah, go for it, Josh. Is to say, what can go wrong at the end of the day? It, it's, it's okay, don't worry about it too much. Okay, Robert says, hi, Phil. Have you tested uh, the Mr. R masks for hard camo uh, on uh, on Buster, say? Mr. R masks, who are they? Uh, um, I think it's the masking solution, the salt. Oh, right. Bar. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, this stuff. Yeah, got you now. It's Mr. Masking Salt R, they call it, isn't it? That's why I was getting a bit off of it. Yeah, I could give it a whirl, actually. 
I'm glad you've uh, returned to the less formal vlogging format. Thanks for the great job from Portugal. I tell you what, I will get Buster out. I've got to do some spraying, probably be tomorrow now, and I will give him a coat and I'll report back to you on one of my less formal vloggings about it. Uh, and we'll see how we get on about that. Um, so yeah, it would be interesting to see how it actually works. Especially for hard camo. I uh, could have done it technically on the bomber thinking about it. Okay, so that was you, Steve, replying to that one. And then we're up to date. Crikey. Just did it again. Did you hear that? That's my thing saying, oh, battery's about to go. So that was quite handy. Well, there we go. No problem. Nice, easy show today. Crikey. Although I've got to get used to my earpiece because it kills my ear. If I do it by a hello bit, it hits my ear. So there we go. Um, are we all up to date? Have you seen any more questions, Steve? Shout. Um, there's some in your. Oh, is there? In your ask Phil question. All right. Okay. Hold on. We'll just uh, go over to that. Uh -huh. If I can get this to work. Come on. God, I hate this tablet. <laughs> right. Okay. Come on. Keep coming. Keep coming. Here we go, right. <laughs> dee, dee, dee. Right, come on, come on, come on. Okay. Okay, can you do a, this is from Mark, uh, do a tips video on winter camo for armor. Uh, forgot to ask on Sunday. Cheers, Mark. Uh, yes, we could probably sort something out, but I've got to do some armour. That's the only thing is, I haven't got anything to do it on. Uh, not unless I wreck some of the, my old stuff. Uh, that's the only problem with that. So now, have you ever done winter camo, Steve? Yeah. Um, last one, we're on a tiger. Yeah. And it's... Again, you have to do your normal camo pattern or whatever it would be normally during the summer do all that and then use the hairspray technique or use one of these new products, chipping products. Yeah. Um, apply that and then you need to start putting over your white paint. Um, what I've found best is don't go for a, do it all over white over the top, kind of do it patchy. So in places it's really faded, other places it's quite heavy on still. And um, think of where the crew's warped and worn it off um, and yeah. don't put the paint over the uh, markings as well because they tended to let the mark um stuff like the crosses and numbers and unit markings stuff like that don't cover them with the white paint and so once you've got that happy with it um, then get out your stiff brush i find a bit of warm water works best and then start rubbing it over the paint where to start activating the hairspray or chippy fluid underneath so you start wearing through the white paint and it gives you that nice patchy effect and nice chipped effect cool absolutely there we go well maybe if i ever get a spare tank i'll give it a whirl with it and uh, see what we can do with that one uh josh was basically asking the same question we were talking about before because he's posted that one up again about the led lights on the bone okay gary says hi phil and team my question is how do you go about choosing the color uh of primer to go with your color of paint. Do you use white uh, to spray yellow? Uh, how about red? Uh, I know that flat paint, uh, it does not seem to matter as much as doing gloss finishes. Uh, I would like to know what you are using. Thanks guys. Go on in, Steve, what do you use mainly? Mainly use, if I can get it in the right place. XX19. XF yeah. Yeah. Nice, light grey, it works perfect on anything. Yeah. The thing is, there's a reason why people use light grey. Uh, the whole idea is it's easy to cover with any colour. That's why grey is the standard primer colour. Um, so when you are coming in perhaps with lighter shades of things, uh, it can be covered over quite easy. If it was a dark colour primer, it's quite hard to cover. So for instance, if you were coming along with a red, okay and you wanted to overcoat that 
uh, and you had like a black underneath it, it's gonna take a lot to get that up. You're always gonna have a dark red, but by putting down perhaps a white primer or a gray, you're gonna have obviously an easier time trying to cover it. So little things, like if you were doing uh, yellow, for instance, as a classic example, I would always put white down first. Um, certainly if I'm using orange as well, I'll put white down first, just because it's easier to coat. Otherwise you're there forever trying to do it. Now, if you're doing something like the engine uh, props, uh, like on my Halifax, all I did was dip them in the yellow by hand, just dip, dip, dip all the way around, let it off to dry, okay, and then dry brushed over the top to give it the wear look. Um, but if you was on a bigger one, say a 132nd, I'd probably do them white first and then go over the top with yellow, just so it's got a, something to look through and everything else. And there is the other thing of the reflectivity of the paint coming through, because it's a light color underneath, it'll reflect the color. But as you say, it's more important when you're doing glosses uh, and stuff like that than it is if you're doing over matte finishes. If you're doing a gloss work, like with the red, perhaps you want to have a white uh, primer underneath because it will reflect the color through a lot better than it would be if you're using black. That said, it's not uber critical when it's on small parts. I think it's more for big stuff um, than it is for doing our type of scale type things like this. But it just makes things easier. Like I did, I think it was the orange tips for the um, that KA27 when I did that one. You know, again, if you were trying to coat that normally over the black, it would have took forever to build up the layers. Quick spray of white first, and then it was two coats of the orange, and it was good to go. No problem with it at all. So it makes it nice and easy and very straightforward. So there we go. Is that it? Just checking. Slightly, yeah. Yeah, we're all up to date. My word, see, look, we're getting quite good at this now. We can whiz through these things. So I'm just checking all the other areas, making sure we've got everybody in. Uh, dee, dee, dee. No, that's it, that's Hans. Right, okay, brilliant. Well, there we go. So Steve, what's your plans for the rest of the week? Um, hopefully get the tornado fully day cold and get that, crack on with that. Yeah. Um, and then carry on with my back to Russian engineering vehicle. I want to start, do a lot more work on that. Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously the Dolphin will be my sighted project. Yes, absolutely. Looking forward to that on Saturday because we can have a yeah. bit of a giggle and a laugh. And You just need to catch up and make sure you've got it all glazed. That's mine. Yeah, I will get it all glazed, yes, definitely. I'll but work on that tonight. Most of it's glazed. Yeah, mine looks exactly as it did on Saturday. <laughs> and there's, a red, there's a red mark on pencil mark, which I've put on there to show you because there's a... Uh, Line. Seam line, isn't it? It's a mold yeah. seam. Yeah. So we need to spend time getting rid of that. Mm -hmm. No, I must admit, I will sort mine out. The only thing I have done, I've put my seats in. They are in. I'm, yeah. Well, mine are all done. I've lost a seat belt and they do need sticking down. Yeah. Places, but seem to have popped up. But yeah. Mm -hmm. Mine's all. Yeah, I must admit mine's all in and done like that. But I haven't done any of the glazing work yet. I have to sort that out. In fact, I've even looked at it. It's under here somewhere still, <laughs> ready for Saturday. So we'll all be good with that. Uh, from my point of view, I'm going to probably spend uh, the rest of today, which what we know, 20 past three, um, just finishing off the next few bits on this one so we can get these done uh, and ready. And so I'm going to leave it then for a couple of days just to go off so it's easy to sand, to be honest, because as I say, we've got big seams and that I need to take care of uh, and making sure that's all good. So what I'll be doing next to tomorrow, which is going to be very exciting, is starting on the FW190. I'm probably going to start either on the engine or the cockpit, and as I said, we're going to do it standalone. So the whole idea of it is it'll be like a half hour and it will just be on that. It might be even more than half an hour. It might be an hour video, but it will just be on like doing the engine, doing the cockpit. Okay, then we'll do the assemblies because generally the assemblies all over are pretty much, you know, pretty straightforward, no problem. Okay, and then bringing it all together, sealing it all up, masking it up, and then we can go in there to town with the paintwork and everything else on it to hopefully bring something a little bit special. But I must admit, I am looking forward to doing it. And I was going back through my history. It's the first time I've actually done a normal FW190 uh, in 30 seconds because I was thinking I've done loads of them but actually it's always the longer version the Dora version but um, yeah so I'm looking forward to doing that one and doing some nice snazzy weathering with it and sort of mottling techniques I think it has a bit of them on that one uh, and everything else so yeah should be a lot of fun something to get me teeth into I get more of the editing finished up finish off the uh, line of that this week and we'll be good to go yep. sorted and then you'll be finishing off your tornado. How much, how much longer do you reckon you got on that? Um, I don't know. It 
shouldn't be too long. Once the day calling's out of the way, I'm not going that much over the top with the Yeah. Um, and then it's on to me for aircraft. I've got to do the 130 second Eurofighter next. Cool. With all the Are you doing in flight? No, on the ground. Oh, it's a shame you could have had it flying with Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I've got all the resin cockpit to go in it and engines and. Yeah. So that should be fun. Yeah, it should be, absolutely. One uh, of the group builds end soon. Which one's that, Steve? Just to remind folks, it's the armor one, isn't it? World War One. Is it? I lost track. This year's flown though, hasn't it? So it has crazy fast this year. Yeah, twenty eighth of May. It's the World War One tanks, dawn of a new age on the battlefield ends, which is yeah, eleven days to go on that one. So you've got eleven days to go with that one, guys. So really push on with that. Obviously, we do a full reveal video at the end of it and everything else like that, as we normally do. Uh, don't forget, there's no medals or prizes for it. It's uh, literally for pats on the back from all of us for that one. Uh, but definitely getting on. That's why I thought I better get my arse in gear and get on with the Osprey. Otherwise, I have no entry for the Animal Sig. Uh, so we get on with that one, get those finished. So that's it from us for today. We'll catch you all on Saturday live. Um, you know, some usual thing. Remember, if you've got any questions, bits and pieces, feel free to post them up in the forum and we'll answer them as we make our way through of trying to mess up the kit. I've still got to sort out what I'm going to do with the door because my door, I've got a dodgy door on mine where he's got a nice door. Um, well, it's only because I'm scavenging one. Oh, we're scavenging a door. Yeah. I might just wing it and try and bend one, as in cut one open and then I've got this acetate clear sheet down here, stuff, thick stuff, and try and mould it. Before you do it, I'd try it on the other door, see if you can do a test run. Using yeah, well that's door, what I was going to do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. See Don't panic. Possible. I have every... <laughs> this will be fine. Watch this space. So I'll do it live anyway. I'll sort of get the door out, get me heat gun or a candle, heat up me acetate and try and mould it because it's got a curve on it. It needs to bend to get it in there. So as long as we can get it looking halfway decent, we should be all right. It should be okay. Righto, well, that's it. Thank you for joining us, Steve. It's okay. Always a pleasure. Yes, as I say, remember, you've got any questions, post them up. We're going to have separate sections. So what I'll do is, after this airs, I'll set the next one up for next week. Put your questions in there. Then, obviously, this one, if you want to watch this video with the questions below it, it'll be archived now in the live section, and you can watch it just like that. So until tomorrow, well, I, well yeah, I won't be here today. I was thinking to do a vlog. I'm not doing a vlog today because we've done this. So I'll be back with you tomorrow. So we'll be doing the walk around vlog. I've spoken about this as well, doing it, uh, and the other bits that are going on. And then uh, we'll catch Steve on Saturday morning. So until tomorrow, everybody, happy modelling and take care. Bye. Bye. Uh, right.